Hello, Brazil. This is Josh Klinghoffer. You're listening to Five Notes with Wendell Correa. Obrigado. Hi, everyone. I'm Wendell Correa. A special interview with Josh Klinghoffer. Thank you so much for having me, man. No, thank you. Thank you. What are your impressions of Brazil? You've been here many times before. Uh, well, I, I, it's a beautiful place. I, I, this trip, we just got here uh, last night, and I... I kind of don't leave my hotel room much anymore because I've seen all these cities and I, I don't know if it's maybe because I'm a little older or just not in, not used to touring. I, I just, all I want to do is play guitar in bed and uh, kind of, you know, read or whatever. I, I, I don't want to go out. <laughs> so, but I mean, I love, I love Brazil. I mean, Brazil is such a fascinating, beautiful country. And uh, it's one of my, I have some of my favorite touring musical memories in Brazil. That's great, man. And we are talking about Portuguese, and you sing in Portuguese, Menina Mulher da Pele Preta, you sing here on Lollapalooza with the Chili Peppers, you record the song. What else do you know about Portuguese? Uh, very little, very little. Um, I, I used to, I tried to have uh, Mauro Hefosco teach me little things here and there, and he taught me that his name is pronounced Hefosco, which is, you know, spelled with an R. Uh, but yeah, I know very little about Portuguese. And when I learned that song, um, I just, I, I sang it over and over and over and over. And over. I tried to learn what the words meant in English, but I, that didn't really, I don't know if I really understood what each thing meant, but I, you know, I, back then I had it down. I could sing it, I could quote it to you back then, but it, that's been years now. I know you are a big, big fan of George Benjot. I think you call him Jorge ben Hor. Anyone else do you join? How did you meet George Benhart? Because he's huge here in Brazil. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I think I called him that uh, incorrectly for a long time. So I, I try and say it like you just said it now. But I don't, um, I don't know. There was a time in my early 20s, late teens, early 20s, where, you know, I, I feel like just the whole world opened up as a musical palette. You know, that uh, growing up liking 90s rock music, And then I feel like when I got my driver's license, I, I looked back in time and it was all about David Bowie and T-Rex and the Stooges and that kind of thing. And then after, you know, the, the, the next time I became musically thirsty, there was an amazing record store in New York called Other Music. There's magazines like The Wire or even the British music magazines like Mojo. Like, you know, there was all these... Um, references to Brazilian music or any, you know, amazing music from everywhere in the world. But I remember Os Mutantes records were re-released around then, I think. Um, and it just seemed like everywhere you went, there was a new amazing Brazilian artist that a friend of yours was listening to. Um, yeah, Tom Zay. Like, I, I just remember, I think he, did he collaborate with maybe Tortoise or something? And they did something on Thrill Jockey Records, maybe. Like, there was just kind of, um, I was really into the band Stereo Lab, and they uh, they had this mix up online, early 2000s or late 90s, and the first song in the mix was a song called, uh, I don't want to pronounce it wrong, but it was by uh, Wanderlea. Wa yeah, Wanderlea. And I was obsessed with that song. It was called, like, Man... Man Zhao, I don't know, M-A-N-E, shit, man, uh, yeah, I don't know, but I was, uh, oh, what? Uh, I thought my house, her? No, no, it was her, it was Wander Leah, it was a song, yeah, anyway, I was obsessed with that song, so reading about her, getting into, just, Brazilian music was a whole new, a whole new uh, area to explore. Did you dig into Bossa Nova? Uh, a little bit, I mean, I, um, just, I had certain jazz records, um, uh, Ellis and Tom, like that kind of thing. Like, uh, it's been a long time since I've listened to some of that stuff, but uh, I'm having a hard time recalling. But yeah, I mean, back then, sort of anything from Brazil, anything with those chords. I remember watching a friend of mine play along to a Brazilian song, a bossa nova song, and thinking, those are chords I've never seen before. And I just remember watching her play them and uh feel like i as soon as i could i picked up a guitar and i i taught myself those chords and that they became part of part of uh my repertoire i the, the song quotes i remember dot hacker song which i had written 
10 years before we turned it into a song was written after learning some of those bossa nova chords trying to figure out and i'm a brazilian it's hard chords to do. do you know tim i think you're really going to enjoy yeah no i i know yeah 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 i was listening to him a lot on the last trip down here which was my 40th birthday so it was like almost four years ago now or th three and a half years ago um yeah he was on heavy rotation He's great. When I talk about the, your new, most recent album, the new album, this is the show. How was the process of writing recording? It was supposed to be a Dot Hackers album, is that right? Yeah. Um, it started out as a sort of 2020 pandemic era collaborative. You know, we're all in different places, file sharing. And um, Clint had been getting into music production and he had done a record of uh, kind of reimagined Lou Reed's Berlin record so he was kind of a producer at this point instead of you know no one none of us were in none of the other guys were in a band and the clint had been working a lot at home so i said how about clint produced this or we all decided this is what it was going to be and we did the song uh divination and that worked out pretty well so the thinking was let's keep going let's do a whole record and it was just fun to reconnect with those guys especially maybe it was easier because it was on zoom we had a, a couple of long you know, hangouts on, on the computer. And then once we started trading songs after that first divina divination uh, success, we, uh, we were finding it a little harder than, the la than that one. So it, it wound up slowing to a halt uh, and Clint and I just kind of carried on because I had written a bunch of songs, uh, enough for a full album and, and he was having a good time working on them. And so we just kind of kept going. You have a favorite track on the album? It, it changes all the time. I haven't listened to it in a while, uh, but um, yeah, it's, it'd be hard to say. I, I've had different favorite songs. Every song on the album has been my favorite at one time or another. And one means the art cover, who created it? You created that cover? Uh, well, I chose it as a cover, um, but it's a famous uh, photograph that I, I, actually, I feel terrible. I can't remember the name of the photographer, but I believe it was, I don't even, I, I think, Life, Time Life may have owned it. That's who we got the clearance from. But it, it's basically the moment where uh, President Kennedy is telling the country that we're we're very close to having a conflict with the Soviet Union over the missiles that were in Cuba. So it was like a, a, a an enormously scary moment for the entire world. And uh, someone just happened to catch that moment whether, you know, I guess everyday folks in an electronic store were watching what could be any day now, the end of the world, you know. And why the name This Is The Show? Um, well, because, it, it, you know, I guess, I mean, it has a, a funny uh, connection to Seinfeld, I think, for, for Clint and I, because I, I think that's what they, they keep saying in, in that show when they're talking about how everyday life this is the show. This is what, you know, and how that show is kind of a comic reimagination of mundane life. But, you know, this uh, this life we're all living, you know, it's kind of, it's pretty absurd a lot of the time. So, you know, when when is it reality and when is it not reality? I'm not quite sure anymore. And the lines may be blurring more so than ever or maybe not. I don't know. Maybe it's just either way. Um, this is the show. So you are also a big fan of city calls. For, uh, of what? City calls like Seinfeld. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I'm of, this, of the age where, you know, the sitcom, uh, the NBC for, in particular, um, that's, I feel like that was one of the first things that taught me about life, you know, like shows like Cheers or um, it'd be a little before Seinfeld, but uh, like, it's, uh, I don't know. Whatever shows my parents were into, I, I, I desperately wanted to be older. So I was always watching, you know, television, Saturday Night Live. It was not a sitcom, but, you know, television used to have more, everything used to have more of a kind of critical role in the culture. And I think that's the world I grew up in. And um, I, I think in certain ways, it's uh, television still reflects back what, what's going on or where we're at but there's also a lot of nonsense on tv now and 
you know, it's definitely not quite like it was when I was younger. Cheers. <laughs> Thanks for the water, Josh. <laughs> it's a great day here in Sao Paulo. <laughs> I have a wonderful view from my room. <laughs> I've never figured out this city. I've I've been here and, you know, I've only stayed in the very, very near to the hotel or I've been taken in a car somewhere and, you know, I have no clue what part of the city I'm in. Here is the south of Sao Paulo and uh, next here is uh, the most known TV, TV station here in Brazil, right next to the hotel. I might be looking at that out of my window, maybe, I think. But the most known place here in Brazil is downtown as well, Avenida Paulista Avenue. And the place that we're going to be is a neighborhood called Barra Funda, Audio. You're probably going to play Audio. It's really great. Do you enjoy sports? Uh, yeah, I do, yeah. Uh, we're not going to have any, any soccer this time because the Brazilian football soccer is going to play on the weekend. So we don't have football this weekend. Great place to you know Brazil. Oh, yeah, of course. No, I, I, I yeah, I... I have followed it at different times in my life. When so uh, football um, is is a hard one for me to keep up with because I don't have a team. Support Palmeiras. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. My team. I don't. I don't want to be. I want to be honest with you and your fans that is watching you. No, I know. I don't know if you guys remember the Chad Smith controversy. Yeah. I mean, you know, I told that story the other day. I know how serious it is. I'm joking. I'm Palmeiras. I don't know Josh. So, I want to talk, oh, you, you need to see Samba here. People playing Samba. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. No, I think I have before, too, yeah. I mean, especially when, when I was on tour with uh, Mauro, but, you know, we, we did some amazing things in Brazil. Like, we went to the Contemporânea store. That was uh, one of the best days of my trip. That um, we, we went to visit a group called Huacti. Do you know? I think they're in Belo Horizonte. They were a group that made their own instruments. Do you know what I'm talking about? Walk, oh, am I saying that right? Walk T? It was U T, I don't know, U A T K I, Walk T? I don't know. U A K T I. T word? Maybe U, U, U A K T I. They, I think they've been around a long time and they all, they make all their instruments. They're all kind of like yogurt tubs and, you know, PVC pipe and household items, and they turn them into these beautiful sounding musical instruments. That's great. And when I talk to you about your career, you started playing the drums when you were nine, right? Yeah. How much instruments do you know how to play now? How many instruments? <laughs> Guitar, bass, piano, keyboards, drums. Yeah, I, I, can, I can fake my way through all the rock and roll instruments. You know, if you put a classical instrument or a a horn in front of me and a jazz instrument or uh or if you tell me to sit in with a jazz man on piano we're out of luck but uh yeah i can mess i can mess around with um you know drums bass keyboards synthesizers here and there not a lot which one do you feel more comfortable playing well the one i feel least comfortable playing is the piano and that's why i kind of like it the most these days because i mean um because you said, which one do I feel mo most comfortable on? I, I don't really know the answer to that, but I, it's because I'm sort of the most out of my league on the piano. I feel like that's what I spend most of my time on, which my guitar playing and drumming suffer for, but... <laughs> Come on, if you don't know how to play... <laughs> yeah, <right>. <laughs> <laughs> better practice. Like, I, I just, you know, there's only so many hours in a day. I always tell myself I'm going to spend, you know, one hour on each a day and, you know... Doesn't always happen. And which is where do you use those to write songs? Uh, piano and guitar, typically in, in the in the past. But I'm sort of, I mean, I haven't really put this into practice yet because all the songs I've been working on lately are piano and guitar. But I'm really envisioning um, working on music that that's really uh, based around the rhythm. So around drums and drums and bass. I really want to kind of, I would love to make a record or a collection of songs that really just starts from drums and has very little else on top of it. That's what I always say to myself. And then I'm sitting there and I go, I'll put this, I'll put this guitar on. We could take it off later if we want. And then the next thing you know, sounds like uh, any, any old band. 
You've got to try Cavaquinho, do you? Uh, no, I don't know that, but I just thought of an, one of my favorite artists or bands or groups, uh, Malro also turned me on to, the, and I screw their name up all the time, Comrade Foragina. Do you know who I'm talking about? Karina Burr is her name? Yeah, I, she's one of the members. Com- I'm probably saying it wrong. Comrade Foragina. I all, if if you don't know them, they're amazing. Yeah, we're gonna check out. And so you are now you're playing with James Addiction, and have played with Chili Peppers and Pearl Jam. How do you develop to the style as a guitarist? Talking about the style and the techniques, the pedal boards. Is it hard for you? Did you get tips from Dave Navarro, especially on James Addiction? No, I haven't had any tips from him. I mean, unless you call just listening to his playing and thinking about him as a a player and a person for 30 years, uh, tips. Um, I've texted with him a little and we've met a few times, but uh, yeah, I, I, we haven't spoken about this. And same with the Chili Peppers. I, I didn't talk to John about doing it once I was going to do it. I just was a fan of both of theirs. And I, you know, I was close to John for a long time. I saw how he played the songs and I've, I've just, I've, I've been a, uh, Jane's Addiction fan for over 30 years and I have lots of live albums and or bootlegs and stuff and uh, yeah I just I mean that's what's and same with Pearl Jam I mean I'm not playing a, a ton of guitar in that band but like there was a there was a, a, a couple shows where Matt Cameron had COVID and I had to play drums a little bit of the sh- some of the show and I just have a a wonderful head start with these particular bands that I've found myself in by knowing and loving their music for th- three decades. So it really makes it easy when you don't really have to think about how the song goes. You can kind of just play, you know, you just play them as honorably as you can. And, you know, I, I, I'm such a, I have such a great respect for these bands and these musicians and these songs and the people that wrote them that, you know, if I, all I want to do is play them with with respect and honor them. People that talk with you, I was watching an interview. Eric Avery, he's even play on the on your album. Eh? This is the show. Uh, yes, he plays on. Yeah, and he plays on the first one as well. He plays on um, "To Be One with You." It's called. Yeah, I was watching one of his interviews, and he mentioned that they. You, he remembered the day he met him was when you were on the Turbo Joy Division with Flynn John Frusciante Steel. Do you remember? Oh, yeah, very well. I remember fairly vividly. It was October 10th, 2000, 10 days after my 21st birthday. No, seven days after my 20, sorry, 10, it's the 10th. So it was seven days, a week after my 21st birthday. And yeah, Flea, John, and I, played at Spaceland in Silver Lake, which was a little club that I could only get into legally for a week now uh, at that point. But yeah, it was, we, we just, we had such a good time playing those songs and John and I had been working a lot together and hanging out a lot at that time. So it felt really passionate for us to play those songs. And uh, John did such an amazing job at playing and singing them and and it was really fun for me to hang out with Flea and play with him for the first time because when we would rehearse, which we did, I think, three or four times at Flea's house, we would jam a lot. And, you know, like, uh, I just remember, you know, we, w- we would start playing things. And I, 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 don't, I don't even think I was playing that much drums at that point either. I had, I've been playing guitar a bit. But, um, you know, we would start playing something that sounded Jamaican, and I, I hadn't really listened to a ton of jamaican music at that point and you know they're they were like oh you know making suggestions what to listen to and um yeah it was a it was just what that was one of my favorite musical memories like that that week the the rehearsals and then that show i mean i couldn't believe how well we did i mean i i just when we the show was over we all went back into the little dressing room and we were kind of we were like little kids we were really excited and then that the dressing room was so small we opened the door to get some air right where the people were walking out And one of the first people that we saw was Eric Avery. And I hadn't met him before, but I knew and I could tell by the look on his face that if he liked what we had just done, then we did really well because that was his band. He he knows that band and that music very, very well with all his being. So 
if the smile on his face was an indication of how well we did, uh, we were, you know, we did well. And then after, so we, I met Eric very briefly there. And, um, and then I met Kevin Haskins from Love and Rockets and Bauhaus, who told me what drum synthesizer I needed to get to properly do uh, She's Lost Control. Yeah, so it was, you know, I was, I was young. It was an amazing night. Always being friends of your idols. How do you deal with that? Uh, well, it's changed over time because, I mean, I guess I, I started becoming friends with my idols in my teens. Um, you know, and you're just trying to survive socially at that point. Like, I, I, I dropped out of school pretty early. I was 15 and I've never looked particularly old. So I was always kind of this little kid hanging out with older people. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess like any relationship, no matter how old anyone is, hopefully you can just be yourself, you know, which is always, especially back then, I, I, I've always questioned what, what is myself? I don't know, you know, especially when you're, you're kind of examining everything that comes out of your mouth. Was that okay? But, you know, are they going to want to hang out with me again? Um, and I guess maybe I, I was lucky enough to have an early start at it to where now when I start hanging out with the guys in Pearl Jam who were all over my wall as a kid, you know, like, it's a little more comfortable for me to 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 be around these people because I finally have um, years of experience being being me, you know, like when I was 17 or, or 18, I hadn't been me for very long. So now I've been me for 40 years or, or 40 or more years and you know i i i don't know how uh i know how much different i can be even if i wanted to this did you have a favorite band when you were one, one particular band uh well i mean when i was a very young kid i remember the beatles and the beach boys were my first favorite bands the two of those at the same time my father had a and my parents both but mostly my dad had a huge collection of records but these 45 inch or i mean four, seven inch 45 singles and uh so many beach boys and beatles and it was just, and my my uncle made me a tape my dad made me tapes so that's who i was obsessed with and then i got into um like guns and roses and molly crew for a little while but my real what i felt like was my my movement was in like sort of 1991 when all the what was called alternative which was always obnoxious Uh, title for it um like all you know all those bands came out you know pearl jam and nirvana oh they i mean came out on ma on the mainstream you know like i i never had heard of them before i was only like 11 years old and they were on television and you know sonic youth was big uh at that time for my friends and i um you know all all, all those kind of bands you know fugazi was huge for me mud honey was huge for me um But yeah, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, you know, all, all the stuff, the Pixies, you know, any, any you know, Jane's Addiction. You know, I got into Jane's Addiction in 90, 1992, I know specifically because it was the year after they broke up. And I remember thinking, damn it, I missed them by a year. But, you know, yeah, that was a very special time to, you know, and a very, very amazing experience to be the age I was at because I was a little too young to you know, be able to go to every concert back then, but, but I really caught the whole decade and was able to see with, uh, grow, kind of grow along with it. Like I, I, I turned in 1990, I turned 11. So who else would you like to play with? Because you play out of Guinness, Barkley, Blackie, BJ Harvey. I don't know. I can't say, I mean, I've kind of played with in one way or another, everyone that I would want to. That's some rumor on the internet. I don't think it's true that you are you 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 have roadie for the Foo Fighters, but you just play, you just jam with them when you were touring with the Chili Peppers on the two uh, thousand, right? Yeah, well, I was in a band called the Bicycle Thief, and we were opening for the Foo Fighters and Chili Peppers, and uh, you know we would all just hang out and see each other in the hallways. That's when I first met Taylor Hawkins, and um, he's a little younger than the other guys, and you know we would always kind of. Like he was around the same age as John Frusciante, so Taylor, John, myself, Chris Warren, who who tours with the Chili Peppers, like we would all kind of hang out, talk music, uh, drink coffee. But yeah, I mean, you know, I would I would watch Foo Fighters sound check, and I think one time their bass player just wasn't he hadn't gotten to the venue yet or something, so I, I played bass for them. Sure, there's a famous picture of you. Yeah, do you know which one it is? 
And people say, oh, he played with the Foo Fighters. I don't think so. I did for one sound check because, I mean, I, when, when, that, when Dave's first record came out, I was a big fan of that first Foo Fighters album. I didn't really follow them after that. Um, I saw them a lot right when they, I, I saw them open for Mike Watt in 95, and then I saw them two nights in a row at the Roxy in L.A., also in 95. They played the song My Hero, which wound up being on the second album. I, I think that song's amazing. Um, Taylor wasn't even in the band yet. It was still Nate and William from Sunny Day Real Estate, and I was a big fan of that band. So, um, yeah, I knew how to play all those songs already. I had figured out the first Foo Fighters album, so when Nate didn't show up, I, I think I, I can't even remember what song I played. It's kind of such a funny little, you know, I think I played with them for eight minutes, you know? <laughs> I noticed your work when you appear on the DVD, Red Hot Chili Peppers DVD off the map. You appear on the DVD, and then I notice, yeah. then I noticed the bicycle thief. You come and go like a pop song. Then I became watching, <laughs> buying your work. I have all the vinyls over the house. In a special moment, 2004, you work a lot with John Frusciante. How was the period? And how many songs have you written? Because there is a lot of songs, and you also work with Jolelli from Fugazi on a taxi. That in that in that time with John, John and I had just been spending a lot of time together back then, hanging out, listening to music. Um, there was a period there where he was living; he was between houses, so he was living at the Chateau Marmont, and it was just the most fun thing to do to go hang out at the hotel. And we, you know, we were just listening to music and sing Beatles songs and work on harmonies and and that's how the song Omission was written. We just one night after listening to singing Beatles songs all night, we we just wrote that song together and I was always using my cassette 8 track and he was he was a fan of the 4 track and I was like, "Oh, you, you know, here the 8 track is really fun." And we did a demo on it on the 8 track. And then we just kind of kept, you know, he had a song, I think the next song was The Slaughter. Um yeah, and he was just writing a ton at that time. I was still, you know, being younger and sort of, I, I wasn't, I'm still not the, the best at finishing songs right away. So I, uh, my writing was a lot slower back then, especially. So the the songs he was working on at the time all became uh, Shadows Collide With People. And uh, yeah, I, mean, I just remember, you know, the Chili Peppers had a, uh, a break after whatever record they had just made. And the plan was for us to go make that record. And then because that album took such a long time, right at the end of it, he had thought, you know, God, I don't want to do that again. We should make records a lot quicker and, and uh, be a little less precious about everything. And he was just writing a ton of songs at the time. And uh, we just kept making records. And, and you know, when, when you're lucky enough to be in a band like the Chili Fevers, you can afford to just go into studios and do, it, do whatever you want. And... Uh, it was I was incredibly lucky to benefit from that experience because it was still and because of who John is and what what our tastes were the way we made records was very you know it was becoming more and more outdated um you know recording to tape doing live takes you know we would work on the songs in his garage and we would cut them live you know and keep them real simple especially i mean even on shadows collab with people we we cut them live and it was kind of too uh bare sounding to have just the two of us tracking so we got chad smith in because i the drumming like for me i had come up with all the drum parts but i had never recorded drums especially in a studio like that all by myself john was in an isolation booth you know so i we would listen to the drum takes and i, I was just ugh, i didn't like them and Chad came down. That was kind of the first time I got to really play with Chad. Now we were doing it as a trio, and the songs came alive. Chad did the most amazing job at listening to my drum parts and my accents and, and recreating them to the point where when I listen to him, I, I forget it's him because it sounds like what I had envisioned, and, and, and he just blew me away. And, you know, we became friends at that point, but we didn't hang out until you know, several years later when I toured with them or when I joined the band, but, you know, I, that making that connection with him when we did that, that R Shadows Collide with People album, it, 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 every, you know, maybe I didn't think about it every night, but when we were on stage with the Chili Peppers, I mean, it was just such a familiarity 
looking at him on the, you know, like playing drums and just giving him, you know, having those kind of, you know, those glances. And, you know, I love Chad. He's one of my all-time favorite musicians and people. Yeah. But then you play drums on the other albums. You even appear on the cover of the Imperium, right? Is that your face over there? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I play I play drums on the, the, the next several records because we stopped being really precious about it. Like on, on Shadows, we felt like everything needed to be perfect. Because you know? Shadows was released by Warner. The other one was in Depenet, right? Yeah, I think, you know, I don't know the specifics, but I think at the time, like he, John had it worked out where, you know, Warner would just put out anything he made And they, you know, they wanted a solo album and then we just wound up taking a long time. We wanted it to be really perfect and uh, kept redoing things and John kept re-singing things. And, you know, it was all fun for me because we just got to be in the studio. But it wound up taking a lot longer than I think he wanted it to. And it was very exhausting. So after that, we did um, the next one is called uh, The World of Death. And we did that one in like two weeks. And then we did Inside of Emptiness in another two weeks, like two months later and then we did the ataxia ones you know over a weekend or something like that. that all came together really fast and then i wound up going on tour with pj harvey and uh the when we did the one sphere in the heart of silence that has both of our names like that was me finally trying to be confident with my writing and my singing which i still wasn't when i listen to that singing i want to throw up it sounds like someone that's so fearful um, but the writing, I, I was always really happy with the the music, the musical composition, um, and uh, but that was that was when I was starting to have to prepare to go on tour, and I was learning a bunch of songs, and yeah, that. Uh, but we did that one quickly too, and you know. But then, and then I went away for the rest of the year. So now the fans man are going to be mad if I don't ask you any chance to work with John Frusciante again one day. Um, You know, I wouldn't say there's no chance. I mean, I've, I've many times I've envisioned one day, like even if <laughs> even if we don't talk much during the process, like I feel like it'd be fun to play some of those songs again or play them live. We never played them live, but um, yeah, you know, I don't know. We don't talk much these days, but I, I've always maintained that you know I, I still have an enormous love for him. You know, he's one of my favorite musicians. One of my favorite writers. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not against the idea. And how I don't want to make a feel uncomfortable. If you don't answer it, that's okay. But how do you feel about the Chili Peppers now? Do you listen to the new albums? I, yeah, I mean, I had to listen to the new albums. I, I, yeah, I, I, I couldn't let myself, uh, I couldn't be, because I was hearing little things about them. So I, I listened to, actually, you know what? I never, I don't think I finished the second one. I was trying to cram it in once before leaving on a plane and I got as far as maybe the ninth song and I don't think I listened to the rest. Uh, don't understand. It must be tough. I understand. <laughs> It's tough only because, you know, like I, I, I honestly think we were doing cooler music. <laughs> I want to hear what our guys were doing. I, you know, I would. Some of the songs became plural one. Yeah, some of them did. Yeah, I, I would love for it to have been finished. You know, I mean, I, that, you know, I, I, I never want to sound negative about anyone doing music, but you know, I, I honestly feel like, you know, I was shocked when I heard their their new record. I, <laughs> and I interview Bob Forrest when you re release on vinyl. You come and go like a pop song a couple of years ago. And he, he said, I was going to call Josh to work on the bicycle team again, but then I'd better call him. Any chance to work with Bob Forrest again? Oh, absolutely. 100%. I just wrote something in Santiago that that is was meant for Bob. I have a bunch. I probably have enough songs on my own in my phone that have little BT, BT 2.0 or Bob next to him. We, and... Uh, Yeah, I mean, he and I are both just hard. We, we're both all over the place, and it's hard to pin us down. And the two guys that produced the first Bicycle Thief album both live in New York or the New York, New Jersey area now. So, you know, without people wrangling the two of us, it's pretty hard to get Bob and I to slow down long enough to do stuff. But I guarantee we will. And what is next for you, Resplutor One? And what are you working on new songs? 
I'm always working on new songs. Yeah, I have five five songs recorded I did right before um, getting busy a couple weeks ago. Um, so um, the, the engineer I work with just sent me some new great mixes of them. They're screaming for my vocals. They just need they need vocals, um, which I plan on doing between South America and and Australia with James. I think I have 12 days or so, so I think it's about enough time to put vocals on these songs and finish some of the writing. But yeah, I mean, I have I have more than half an album I started last year when we were first getting our studio together. So if I can talk myself out of like obsessively trying to do this uh, seven inch thing where I have six songs tied to each album, then maybe I'll just put the songs from last year and the five songs I just did out as one album and then I'll have a new album. Um, but, but half of me wanted to keep the five I just did as B-sides and take the the seven or so from last year and turn them into a specific album. I don't know. I have a lot of time uh, in hotel rooms and on airplanes these days uh, to think about what to do. Most important thing is just finishing the songs. So, But yeah, I don't know what is in the future for Floral One. I mean, I just, I'll never stop writing and luckily... Um, now I have the opportunity to record them fairly easily. Uh, so if, yeah, there, there'll probably just be tons of music coming. That's great. I'm definitely looking forward to hear it. And last question I want to do to you. If you could go back in time and talk with young Josh, with 15 years old, that broke his guitar when arguing with his mom <laughs> about his musical career. Now where, where you are, what would you told him? I don't know. I, I honestly don't know because uh, you know, if I would have whispered any information into the ear of that person, um, I certainly wouldn't be sitting here in the same exact way. Um, and even if I had said something high-minded and philosophical like just just be okay with where you are and just be okay with the now and and everything that this moment is giving you, and don't always obsess on the future, which is what I'm telling myself all the time. Uh, if, if I said that to that kid back then, I don't know. I don't. You know, like it, it probably took a obsessively trying to figure out who I was as a writer and a and a musician to get into the position to be playing with these amazing people. So I don't know. One. Even if I sneezed or blew in the ear of that 15-year-old kid, I'm sure it would have altered the trajectory of that kid's life enormously. Thank you so much, Josh. Thank you for having me. Thank you for inspiring all of us, not only with your music, because I'm a human being you are. Thank you so much. Uh, no, thank you. I, I can't. I, obrigado. And thank you for your label. All so nice for us. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Josh Klinghoff for Cinco Notas.